thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, who in thy wisdom and goodness hast appointed the office of rulers and parliaments for the welfare of society and the just government of men, we beseech thee to behold with thy abundant favor us thy servants, whom thou hast been pleased to call to the performance of importance thrust in these islands. Let thy blessing descend upon us here assembled, and grant that we may treat and consider all matters that shall come under our deliberation in so just and faithful a manner as to promote thy honor and glory, and to advance the peace, prosperity, and welfare of these islands, and of those whose interests thou hast committed to our charge. And this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Good morning, members. And members, uh, it's tradition that we recognize former members of this house when they've passed. And while we all recess from these chambers, a former member, the Honorable Member Colin Pierman, passed away. So we're going to take a moment of silence in honor of the late member. Please join me in standing for that moment. Thank you, members. You can be seated. Members, the confirmation of minutes, the minutes of July 15th to be confirmed. Members, have uh, you received your minutes? Any, comf any amendments or adjustments? There are none. The minutes will be confirmed as printed. Messengers from the governor. There are none. Announcements by the speaker. First, let me announce, uh, you may have noticed in the speaker's gallery here to my left, a new face, a new staff member. We'd like to acknowledge Ms. Adriana Smith, who will be uh, a part of our staff that assist the members as we do our business here in the House. I'd also like to acknowledge that I've received as customary when members are absent, they send notice that they'll be absent. I've received notice from the following members that Minister Wilson, A.G. Simmons, um, MP Kim Swan, MP Jamal Simmons, MP Scott Pearman, MP Caesar Wade, and MP, um, MP Caesar and MP Wade will all be absent today. Messengers from the Senate, there are none. Papers and communications to the House. There are six of those. Premier, I think the first is in your name. Good morning to you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be back in this chamber. Yes, it is. Mr. Speaker, I have the honor to attach and submit for the information of the Honorable House of Assembly the Investment Business Class B Registered Persons Order 2022, made by the Minister of Finance and exercise of power conferred by Section 13.1A of the Investment Business Act 2003. Thank you. The Mr. Speaker, Mr. I have yes. the honor to attach and submit for the information of the Honorable House of Assembly, the Investment Business Order, non registerable Persons Designated Order 2002, made by the Minister of Finance pursuant to Section 13.1b of the Investment Business Act 2003. Thank you. 
Mr. Speaker, I have the honor to attach and submit for the information of the Honorable House of Assembly the Investment Business Client Money Amendment Regulations 2022 made by the Minister of Finance pursuant to Section 40 of the Investment Business Act 2003. Thank you. I note that the next two in the name of the Minister of Health, who has indicated she wouldn't be present today, is any member? Deputy Premier? Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Good, Good morning. morning, members of the House and the listening public. I will do these submissions on behalf of the Minister of Health. Yes. Mr. Speaker, I have the honor to attach and submit for the information of the Honorable House of Assembly the Bermuda Hospitals Board Annual Report 2016-2017. Thank you. And I go on to the next Yes, you may. Mr. Speaker, I have the honor to attach and submit for the consideration of the Honorable House of Assembly the Public Health COVID-19 Emergency Extension Number 1 Order 2022 proposed to be made by the Minister of Health in exercise of the power conferred by Section 107A of the Public Health Act 1949. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Minister Frabert, I believe you're introducing for the Minister's Board. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. Mr. Speaker, I have the honor to attach and submit for the information of the Honorable House of Assembly, the Bermuda Sport Anti-Doping Authority Annual Report 2022. Thank you. Reports of committees? There are none. I'm sorry, petitions? There are none. Statements by ministers and junior ministers? This morning we had 10 statements. The first statement this morning is in the name of the uh, Premier. Premier, would you like to present your statement? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, Bermuda's economy continues to be driven by international business. This summer, we saw a record number of young Bermudians enter the industry as interns, graduate trainees, or full-time employees in the various sectors. The growth encountered in international business provides significant positive impact on the local economy. In the wake of the worldwide restrictions on travel and in-person meetings, there is a renewed sense of energy and urgency to reconnect again, and the government of Bermuda must re-engage with the industry. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to advise this Honorable House that between the 7th and 14th of September, I traveled to Prague and Brussels for a series of meetings with top officials from the European Commission and Council of the European Union, as well as member state and third country representatives industry representatives, Brussels-based thought leaders, and other stakeholders. The trip was planned around the Association of Bermuda Insurers and Reinsurers, known as ABIR, Annual Regulatory Dialogue, <clears throat> held in Brussels from the 8th to the 9th of September. As it was ABIR's first event in Brussels since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, it was an important occasion to demonstrate the government support for our local industry partners and for the Bermuda market more globally. I have the pleasure of delivering the conference closing remarks over a seaside chat moderated by Stephen Catlin, chairman of the Convex Group. Mr. Speaker, the timing of ABIR's regulatory dialogue gave me the opportunity to attend the biannual EuroFi conference, the largest gathering of financial services stakeholders in Europe. Attendance at this conference facilitated many networking opportunities and side meetings, including with Petra, King Kalanka, the chair of the European Insurance Supervisor, known as AOPA, with Colin Bell, CEO of HSBC Bank PLC and HSBC Europe, and with fintech businesses interested in domiciling in Bermuda. It would not be an exaggeration to say that these interested businesses literally tracked us down during the conference in order to get more information. This is truly a testament to Bermuda's leadership within the fintech and digital asset space and shows the value of participating in events such as these. Mr. Speaker, a key objective of this trip was to refresh and deepen connections with financial services and taxation stakeholders in the European Union, with special attention to, first, maintaining Bermuda's equivalence under Solvency II, second, being removed from Annex II, otherwise known as the State of Play document of the Council of the European Union's Code of Conduct Group. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to say that the trip was a success on all counts. On the European Commission side, I met with the European Union Commissioner for Financial Services, Financial Stability, and Capital Markets Union, Commissioner Marianne McGuinness. We had a positive exchange regarding Bermuda's reinsurance sector 
and the importance of solvency to equivalents. We also discuss Bermuda's strength on anti-money laundering and how it relates to our regulation on digital assets. Commissioner McGinnis was particularly interested in finance renewable energy and green investment, and I was pleased to speak about Bermuda's new energy regulatory sandbox and Bermuda's work on climate risk finance. She also took note of our comments on the need to highlight countries that are achieving compliance in key areas rather than just the focus on weakness and non-compliance. Mr. Speaker, I also met with Gerasimos Thomas, the Director of the Director General for Taxation and Customs, known as DG Tax Ud. While we must await the official reports on the 4th of October, I am pleased to share that we received very positive feedback on Bermuda's progress to address our commitments under Annex 2 of the Code of Conduct Group. This was echoed by the Chair of the Code of Conduct Group, Madam Ludmila Petkova, who I also met with in Brussels. Based on all of the discussions and the information that the Bermuda government has received, there is no expectation that Bermuda will be kept on Annex 2 when the list is updated on the 4th of October. Mr. Speaker, on the member state side, we held meetings with Mike McGrath, Assistant Financial Secretary in the Financial Services Division in the Irish Department of Finance, who is also the Vice Chair of the EU Financial Services Committee, which helps pre prepare the Council's ECOFIN meetings. The delegation also met with the Irish Ambassador to the European Union, Mr. Tom Haney, and Estonian Ambassador to the EU, Mr. Ivo Orav, as well as key members of their teams. <clears throat> Meeting with member states is crucial so that Bermuda can advocate for our interests directly and can strengthen our engagements on areas of mutual interest. In all of our meetings, our message was clear. Bermuda is a transparent, cooperative jurisdiction committed to strong regulatory standards and high levels <clears throat> of compliance. And we are a trusted partner to the European Union during these uncertain geopolitical times. Mr. Speaker, another objective of this visit was to buttress Bermuda's reputation in non-finance related policy areas, namely on climate change and sustainability. This was a topic of interest across all meetings and especially in the meeting with Alina Bardram, Acting Director of International Affairs and Climate Finance in the Director General for Climate Action in the European Commission. Ms. Bardram was impressed by Bermuda's leadership on ocean monitoring and climate risk finance and suggested new opportunities for Bermuda to engage more closely with the European Commission on these topics. During the visit, I also met with representatives of the UK mission to the European Union, including the UK ambassador to the European Union, Mr. Lindsay Crosdale Appleby. We engaged on many topics, including the Bermuda, UK, EU relationship post-Brexit and areas for further potential cooperation, such as on climate outreach. Mr. Speaker, one of the highlights of the trip was the reception organized by the government of Bermuda's Brussels office with about 50 attendees from EU member state representations, European Commission, European Parliament officials, influential think tank leaders, private sector representatives, and third country representatives. This reception gave yet another opportunity to share the Bermuda message, which was well received by all in attendance. Mr. Speaker, the European Union is a key trading partner for Bermuda and plays an increasingly important role in setting international standards in area of vital importance to our economy. The impact and support provided by Bermuda companies to the EU infrastructure and in the management of risk is important and expanding. The government of Bermuda will continue to engage actively with the European Union institutions, its member states and other stakeholders, both through visits such as these and through our Brussels office to ensure that relationships continue to be strengthened and Bermuda's interests are protected. Mr. Speaker, those interests include the protection of Bermuda and jobs in a sector that is increasingly being chosen by our young people. Their aspirations and those of their parents who support them demand that we continue to promote Bermuda internationally to ensure growth and opportunity locally. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, uh, Mr. Premier. I believe the second statement is also yours. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Continue. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to provide this Honorable House and the people of Bermuda with an update on the work being carried on 
out by the Ministry of Finance. In the first instance, I'd like to advise this Honorable House of the latest estimates relating to the 2021-2022 budget arising from the extensive work done to prepare for the audit of the Consolidated Fund. Mr. Speaker, based on the numbers submitted for the audit of the Consolidated Fund, the 2021-22 budget deficit is now projected to be $81 million. This is $44 million, or 35% below the original estimate of $125 million, as presented in the 2021-2022 budget statement. The revenue is projected to be $1.07 billion, $74 million above the original 2021-2022 estimate of $991 million, primarily due to increases in customs duty, stamp duty, civil aviation receipts, payroll tax, and increased revenue from the travel authorization. In relation to current account expenditures, they are now projected to be $945 million, $42 million above the 2021-22 original estimate of $903 million. It should be noted that COVID expenditures are projected to total $37 million, $22 million more than the original estimates, which includes $20 million for the minimum revenue guarantee to Skyport and $10 million for unemployment benefits. Mr. Speaker, interest guarantee management costs are projected to be $133 million, $5 million more than original budget, which most of this increase related to costs for the failed Morgan's Point project, which was guaranteed by the OVA government. Capital account expenditures are projected to be $76 million, $17 million less than originally budgeted. Mr. Speaker, the continued strengthening of the economy is already evident in the first quarter numbers that the Ministry of Finance has received to date. As indicated earlier, the actual revenues in 2021, 2022 in certain key areas were higher than originally predicted for that year, resulting in the lower than forecast 2021-2022 deficit. Therefore, it is expected that the loss in income from the aircraft register as a result of the Russia-Ukraine war will be offset by stronger payroll tax, land tax, stamp duty, customs duty, and tourism-related revenue from our stronger-than-expected tourism season. Mr. Speaker, tourism revenue for the current year is now expected to increase by approximately $30 million above initial estimates. This increase, along with the improvement of the 2021-2022 deficit position, will enable the government to fulfill the promise given in the 2022-2023 budget statement to provide even more relief to the people of Bermuda who have been negatively affected by rising global inflation. Mr. Speaker, this House has already passed relief measures such as increased support for financial assistance, payroll tax rebate for 75 percent of Bermuda's workers, and support for parents of public school students. Further, we have froze the price of fuel at February levels, and later today, we will table a bill to eliminate customers' duty on essential goods, <clears throat> which will further benefit working families by reducing food prices as this government takes action to deal with rising global inflation. Mr. Speaker, this government will also invest in critical infrastructure to stabilize the Tynes Bay Waste to Energy Facility to reduce the risk of landfilling returning to Bermuda. Finally, the Cabinet has approved additional funding to, Bermuda, to the Bermuda Housing Corporation to address the shortage of affordable housing, which will be detailed by the Honorable Minister of Public Works in this Honorable House next week. Mr. Speaker, despite the relief that this government is giving to working families and the additional investment in housing that is needed after years of underinvestment, it is expected that the government will meet the deficit target of $70 million. When this deficit is combined with the deficit figures from last year, this will see the government's net debt position in a much stronger position than forecast during February's budget presentation. The March 31, 2022 net debt level was $48 million lower than previously forecast in the budget statement. 
In addition, as at March 31, 2023, net debt is now forecast to be $60 million and originally estimated in budget statement projections. Mr. Speaker, the figures that I just mentioned highlights the results of the successful execution of Bermuda's economic recovery plan, which has seen government revenues increase, economic growth that has exceeded expectations, 5.4% in 2021, and the strongest growth in international business since 2007. The successful management of Bermuda's economy has been recognized by external ratings agencies and by investors as noted from the results of the recent debt refinancing. There will continue to be close scrutiny of the government's revenue and expenditures to ensure that debt and fiscal metrics continue to move in a positive direction. Mr. Speaker, I will now turn to matters related to the refinancing of government's debt. In accordance with Section 2.3 of the Government Loans Act, I'm pleased to inform this Honorable House of a successful capital markets transaction that occurred on the 15th of August 2022 to issue $390 million of additional senior notes due in 2032. Mr. Speaker, honorable members will recall that on the 1st of July 2022, the government issued $500 million of new senior notes due in 2032, which was used to pre-fund an upcoming private placement maturity in December 2022 and to refinance the outstanding senior notes due in January 2023. Mr. Speaker, at that time, global bond markets had seen unprecedented levels of volatility, with interest rates having dramatically increased from record lows. In response to an uncertain market, the government made a key decision to de-risk the transaction by prioritizing its most immediate refinancing needs. As a result, the government took the strategic decision to issue $500 million to address the short-term refinancing needs and to defer the refinancing of the 2024 debt. To refinance that longer-term debt would have required raising almost $1 billion in new capital and would have been offered at higher interest rates, which would have increased Bermuda's interest payments. Mr. Speaker, following the July offering, the, Minister of the Ministry of Finance continued to prudently monitor market conditions for opportunities to target the 2024 notes. Issuance markets continued to improve, U.S. Treasuries and credit spreads narrowed significantly, and in early August, Bermuda's new 2032 senior notes issued the month prior were trading at a significant premium to par value. Consequently, on the 15th of August, Bermuda reopened the initial offering and issued an additional $390 million of the same 5% senior notes due in 2032 but at a placement yield of 4.54%, or 54 basis points lower than in July. It also achieved a spread of 175 basis points over U.S. Treasuries, equal to the second lowest spread ever achieved by Bermuda. Demand for the reopening was largely anchored by the same lead investors from the original offering in July, who were supportive of Bermuda's financing strategy and we're looking to continue to increase their existing exposure to Bermuda due to our strong economic performance. In addition, we also saw demand from investors who did not participate in the July offering. Mr. Speaker, I will also note that the 10-year U.S. Treasury was at 2.79% at the time of the reopening execution, which was about 1% lower than where rates are today. Additionally, with the notes issued at a premium, the proceeds were sufficient to redeem the approximately $400 million of outstanding notes due in 2024. When combined with the initial issuance, gross debt taking into account the retirement of the upcoming $154 million in notes will actually decline by about $6 million. Mr. Speaker, these latest transactions have allowed the government to fully refinance all of its near-term external debt with more than four years until the next maturity in January 2027. As a result of our management of the country's finances and the successful execution of Bermuda's economic recovery plan, we have not had to utilize the country's sinking fund balance for management of ongoing cash needs to the extent originally projected. Therefore, this gives the option for the government to repay the $50 million in Bermuda dollar debt outstanding next year without having to refinance this debt. 
This will allow for further reduction in outstanding debt and is positive news. Mr. Speaker, our focus in these matters has been to ensure that Bermuda continues to implement a strong and robust fiscal and debt management strategy. Consistent with this approach has been this government's management and oversight of matters related to government issue guarantees. Such guarantees have been issued to support sustainable economic growth and to protect the safety, health, and economic well-being of our residents. We have worked closely with Bermuda Hospitals Board, particularly to provide support during the significant challenges that resulted from the COVID-19 pandemic. As a result, relief was provided to the Bermuda Hospitals Board in relation to payroll tax, as well as waivers relating to immigration fees and customs duty. The previous relief on payroll tax and immigration fees expired on August 31st, 2022, and has now been extended to March 31st, 2023. In addition, the government is working closely with the Clarion Bank in relation to the $2.5 million guarantee issued to the Bank for Inno Fund to support the continued growth and development of a tech incubator in Bermuda. Mr. Speaker, the successful execution of this refinancing initiative, coupled with the recent positive investments, assessments by independent ratings agencies, and the strong economic growth which is now taking place due to the successful execution of Bermuda's economic recovery plan, reinforces the fact that Bermuda's economy is on the right track. However, Mr. Speaker, too often in Bermuda's history, the story has been purely the health of the balance sheet or the apparent skill at achieving some measure of fiscal discipline and accounting mastery. Yes, this is important, and it is something with, what, with which we must continue to aspire. But, Mr. Speaker, a healthy or improved balance sheet must be used to support the people we represent. It makes no difference to the struggling mother who is working two jobs to keep the lights on that the government reduces its deficit unless those savings and better than expected fiscal performance means relief for her and her family. Hard-working Bermudians have had to endure plenty of shared sacrifice and it is high time that the people benefited from shared success. Mr. Speaker, this government's fiscal performance provides us with the scope to do just that. And as promised in this year's budget statement, relief now and more relief to come, the government will outline further measures to return more funds to working families in the coming weeks and will keep its promise to ensure that the shared success is not kept by the government but shared with the hard-working taxpayers of Bermuda to help working families cope with increasing global inflation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Premier. The next statement this morning is in the name of the Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier. Thank you and good morning, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am tabling today the bill entitled the Fuels Bill 2022. This bill is a watershed moment in the regulation of fuel in Bermuda. As first and foremost, it moves the responsibility of regulation of fuels under the auspices, under the Office of Government to the regulatory authority. The regulatory authority, or RA, was conceived of over a decade ago to be Bermuda's multi-sector regulator responsible for any network industry deemed appropriate to be regulated. Mr. Speaker, because of the strength and capacity the RA has built, regulating the vast sectors of electronic communication I'm told that people are having difficulty hearing, Mr. Speaker. Sorry for Sorry, Mr. Speaker. All right. Let me just go back to that sentence, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, because of the strength and capacity the RA has built in regulating the vast sectors of electronic communications, electricity, and more recently, submarine communications cables, the time is right for adding the fuel sector to the RA's portfolio. It is therefore critical 
to the understanding of this bill to consider its provisions in conjunction with the Regulatory Authority Act of 2011, which sets the rules of engagement between the regulator and any regulated industry under its purview. This bill defines those things that are unique, specific, and critical to the fuel sector. Mr. Speaker, the fuel bill seeks to make the regulatory authority responsible for not only the regulation of the economic aspects of regulating the sector, but also proposes broader oversight to tie in environmental safety and health regulations under one main umbrella. The addition of fuels to the RA also provides synergy in determining the cost to the consumer, both in considering the fuel surcharge and fuels at the gas station. The RA will, as for the submarine communications cable sector, be the one-stop shop for all matters of licensure. The bill defines to whom the legislation will apply and the key terms of the industry. It is important here to make the distinction between this bill applies only to those who sell fuel to others as their primary business. This means, Mr. Speaker, in broad terms, the bill will apply to those entities that import fuel for the purposes of selling it in turn to others and those who in the primary business of selling fuel in the context of gases for cooking and heating or fuels for vehicles. Mr. Speaker, at a high level, the purpose of the proposed fuels bill are to ensure that Bermuda has an appropriate and adequate fuel supply to meet its needs, to ensure safe, efficient, economic, and environmentally responsible operation of the fuel sector, to ensure the continuity of service in ensuring the continued good management and maintenance of critical infrastructure like pipelines, storage tanks, for example, to protect the interests of consumers by ensuring fuel pricing is fair and transparent to promote competition where appropriate and feasible, and to promote investment in the sector that is beneficial to the economy, the people, and the environment of Bermuda. The Fuels Bill also sets out the functions of the regulatory authority and the minister setting the boundaries of responsibilities to ensure that all regulatory activities are conducted with transparency and fairness to all participants, while enabling the minister to set policy and priorities. With regulation will come licenses for the actual business in the local fuels market. To be clear, Mr. Speaker, this is not to be construed as any transfer of responsibilities for matters of fire safety, planning, or environmental health. Those agencies will continue to hold responsibilities for the areas they do at present, and the new licenses will require compliance with all relevant acts as before. But in this new setting, the ability to conduct business will be necessarily and, in and instructively linked to those compliances. The bill provides an additional layer of protection and a centralization of service for any new participants in the sector. To be clear, as the matter of competition is being considered in the context of this new bill, there is no intent to lifting the existing moratorium on filling stations. Competition may come in several forms, including the possibility of the introduction of new fuels to Bermuda like biofuels or hydrogen as those technologies continue to develop. Mr. Speaker, lastly, but by no means least, are the provisions for offenses and penalties which are envisioned to be sufficiently strict so as to give additional teeth to existing safety and environmental regulation. For the avoidance of doubt, Mr. Speaker, 
the bill presents the beginning of our harder work, as it is the framework of which the regulations will be built. The regulations under design at the moment will provide for details, the applications for fuel license, including different types of fuel and different classes of operator. It is envisioned that the regulations will not be prescriptive, but allow for entrance with new and different products to participate in the local market. Those fuels might include biodiesel or even hydrogen as the technology becomes increasingly more feasible. Regulations will also include actions and conditions to licensees, including public information and measures to ensure transparency while preserving proprietary information. Mr. Speaker, like many similarly sized and situated jurisdictions, Bermuda's fuel sector has multiple single points of failure in which if any one of those elements of critical infrastructure were to be disturbed or taken out of service for any reason, the entire country could be adversely affected. Regulations will also define those elements of critical infrastructure and prescribe rules to govern and ultimately protect them, thus providing another layer of reliability and, and accountability for those components. Mr. Speaker, service to the people of Bermuda is the single greatest purpose of this bill, protecting consumer interests with fairness and transparency in all aspects of regulation is paramount to the ultimate efficacy of the legislation and therefore will be addressed in greater detail, not just in regulations, but also through the processes of the RA in general determinations. Among the most important aspects of the regulations and indeed of the regulatory process is the inclusion of and consultation with industry. Regulations will not be derived in a vacuum, but rather in fulsome discussion and conversation with industry, including not only the main importers, but the filling stations and operators as well. Mr. Speaker, I must add clarity and assurance in the matter of pricing in particular. Just as with the other regulated industries, under the auspice of the regulatory authority. At present, pricing methodologies will be developed through the general determination process of the regulatory authority, which is required by law in accordance with the Regulatory Authority Act of 2011 to be inclusive, consultative, iterative, and transparent. The public, the paying customer, deserves no less. And the bill seeks to ensure that good practices are carried through the fuel sector for the benefit of all. Mr. Speaker, regulations will also ensure that transitional matters are addressed so that operators and sectoral participants currently in the market will be allowed to continue their businesses with confidence and certainty, with a commitment to regularizing their licensing and ensuring that their operations go forward under the new regulatory regime without interruption or disruption. With all of this change will also come preparation. And so the RA will have some work to do before it is able to assume the reins of the fuel sector. And the regulations will ensure that the transition is sensible and as smooth as possible. Mr. Speaker, in closing, the legislation promotes and strengthens our sustainable goals. The fuels bill once passed will protect the people of Bermuda in ensuring fairness and transparency. It will ensure that the interests of sectoral participants are protected by providing rules and guidelines for the RA and the government. Bermuda's environment will be protected by ensuring that related offenses are met with appropriate, proportional, and serious penalties. Ultimately, the economy will be promoted by ensuring that there is regulatory certainty for all investors, both new and existing in the fuel sector. 
The bill will uphold the pillars of sustainability and contribute to Bermuda's continued growth and prosperity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Deputy. The next statement this morning is in the name of the Minister of Health. Are we carrying that or someone's going to read it this morning for her? Um, we'll carry that over, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> we'll carry it over. Okay. Thank you. The next statement then would be in the name of the Minister of Education. Minister. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Good morning, now, before colleagues. You, before you start, uh, Minister, members, let me just remind you that um, if you would like to ask questions, I need to be notified. So I haven't had anyone notify me yet to have questions, just as a reminder. Thank you. Continue. <laughs> Continue, Minister. If it pleases you, Mr. Speaker. I, I know we've been away from this chamber, so I have to refresh members on processes. So that was simply to remind us on the protocol of how we get notified. The Speaker gets notified. I know everyone's been used to using the uh, virtual space to do it, but I need it physically now. Mr. Speaker, this morning I rise to update this honorable house and the listening public on government's $150 relief initiative for parents and guardians who have children enrolled in the public school system. The $150 relief is part of the government's overall $15 million economic relief package to ease the financial burden on working families in Bermuda. Mr. Speaker, Parents know their children's needs to prepare them for a good start in school. This government has provided $567,000 to help alleviate parents' yearly school expenses. The primary purpose of the, of the release is to help parents and guardians purchase school supplies, whether it be school shoes, sneakers, uniforms, sweaters, school bags, lunch kits, etc. Mr. Speaker, while the Ministry of Education is responsible for education in Bermuda, including private schools, funding for the provision of schooling is reserved for public schools only, Bermuda's only comprehensive system. As such, the provision of the $150 student grant is available to students in the public school system only. Mr. Speaker, the $150 relief is a one-time payment to parents and was rolled out on September 2, 2022. Technical officers from the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Finance took the time to ensure the application and payment process was thorough and payments were provided to eligible persons only. The Department of Education's power school system has been set up so that eligible parents can submit their applications directly into the system. Mr. Speaker, every parent or guardian of a public school student has access to this system. When a child is enrolled as a public school student, they are given an account with logon details. Parents are positioned to check their, ch their child's school grades and daily attendance and obtain other information that the student or teachers may share with parents. The $150 relief application form has been designed within PowerSchool and is linked directly to each student's PowerSchool account using the student's school ID number. Only parents and guardians listed as the primary contact on the student's PowerSchool account are eligible for the $150 relief. Mr. Speaker, parents were, were provided with an eight-step, easy-to-follow list of instructions on how to apply for the $150 relief. Visual graphics were issued so they could follow the steps on the graphics for resetting their power school account and completing the application form. A list of frequently asked questions or FAQs was also prepared and shared with parents. Should parents have further questions or require further assistance, they should email relief at moed.bm. Mr. Speaker, like anyone being paid from the public purse, all payments must adhere to the financial compliance requirements of the Accountant General's Office. This means that for persons applying for the relief, a government-issued ID must be submitted along with proof of documents showing a bank account number with the same name and address of the applicant. Mr. Speaker, a completed application is one where the primary parent listed in PowerSchool has submitted the application form providing all required information and emailed the banking confirmation details as per government's financial compliance requirements. Once the application and banking information has been verified, a payment request is sent to the Accountant General. After their due diligence and compliance checks, the funds are sent to the parent's bank account. I take an opportunity to remind parents and guardians to ensure that all information sent is accurate. 
The minimum time for the processing from application to payment is 10 business days after submitting a completed application. Mr. Speaker, while in theory, the application process is straightforward, this exercise has revealed various scenarios that have led to unforeseen delays in some payment dis disimbursements. To date, the team working on vetting has come across, one, applications by persons who are not the primary parent. Two, applications are submitted but requiring supporting documents that are not sent in a timely fashion or following the process for it to be easily vetted. Three, the Office of the Accountant General requiring banking and ID documentation not matching the person who has applied. Four, while having power school accounts, parents have either never accessed the system before or have not accessed it in a long time, leading to difficulties remembering logon details, passwords, or how to navigate to the application form. Five, children in the same household having different primary parents assigned in power school. And six, parents not recognizing an application must be made separately for each child in order for government to maintain a clean accounting and auditing record. Mr. Speaker, we are always encouraged to see opportunities instead of problems. The unforeseen various issues I've just listed have helped uncover improvements that can be made to operate the power school system. Parents who may have never used the system before now have an opportunity to see what information they can get from, from its effective use. Lastly, it has helped us update parents' contact information and correct incorrect or outdated information. I take this time to apologize to anyone who has applied and has not received their $100, $150 relief payment. We are bound by government's financial due diligence and want to ensure the correct parent receives the payment. Mr. Speaker, we recognize that not every parent or guardian has access to a computer. The application form can be filled out using a desktop computer, a laptop or a tablet, or a cell phone using the internet. We are confident that our parents have one of these types of devices on hand to use. In fact, to date, the ministry has experienced only two parents who have called in or visited the ministry offices to share that they did not have a computer. In those instances, immediate assistance was provided to show them how to apply for, for the $100 relief using their cell phone. Similarly, Mr. Speaker, we understand that not all parents or guardians have bank accounts. Therefore, a process has been put in place for parents to inform the ministry with the correct information provided, payments can be made out by check. Mr. Speaker, the $100.50 relief was launched on February, February, September 2nd. A total of 434 parents submitted applications on this day. During the remainder of that weekend, including Labor Day, 426 parents submitted applications to claim the relief. We can report as of yesterday, September 29th, the ministry has received 2,253 applications from parents or guardians of which 1,725 applications have been vetted for approval by the ministry and forwarded to the Accountant General's Office for payment. Of those 1,725 vetted payments, the Accountant General's Office has processed 933 for payment. Mr. Speaker, it is mindful that some parents may choose not to apply for the $100.50 relief. Some say, I have finished purchasing school supplies, while others say, we, we do not need it right now. Although this might be the case, the $150 can be used later in the school year. Their children may lose a pair of shoes, need a new sweater for the cooler months, or replace a gym uniform, for example. The government's financial support can cover these instances. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, in closing, I encourage all eligible parents to apply for the $100.50 relief, as this provision by the government to ease the financial burden of our families with children enrolled in the public school, parents will have until Monday, October 31st, to apply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. The next statement this morning is in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the name of the Minister of Works. Minister? Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Morning. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to provide a further update on the Tynes Bay Waste to Energy Facility. Honorable members may recall in February of this year, the then Acting Minister of Public Works advised his house on the $150 million capital program for the refurbishment of the waste to energy facility and the commencement of the said program. Though the ministry continues to advance the initiative, additional challenges have arisen since the aforementioned announcement, such as the catastrophic failure of one of two overhead refuse cranes, which happened in April of this year. During normal operation of the crane, the entire hoist and access platform collapsed as the support welds failed to due to ex excessive fatigue. 
Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to state that no one was injured during this incident, but it does highlight the critical nature of works under the refurbishment program. Mr. Speaker, out of an abundance of caution, the remaining crane was then inspected and emergency repairs to the valves were completed, mm -hmm. leaving it as the only operational crane available for the next several months, consequently slowing daily operations and putting the redundancy of the plant at risk while also compromising the existing contingency plans. Mr. Speaker, to further exacerbate the situation, the Ministry has been notified by vendors connected to the refurbishment program that there are significant delays in product delivery times attributed to global supply chain issues resulting from the fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic and ensuing economic climate, thusly affecting the commencement of the refurbishment works. Delivery times for specialized equipment have been extended by some 12 weeks and in certain instances up to 42 weeks. The delay has a cascading effect which pushes the initial five-year plan back further to an unspecified date. Colleagues will know that I don't mince my words. The current state of the facility is incapable of lasting this time to await the major refurbishments to commence. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, to preserve the facility until major maintenance can begin, the Cabinet has recently approved a stabilization program of projects that focuses on replacing critical systems required to bridge the gap between their current condition and the newly renovated facility at an estimated cost of $22 million. To avoid any confusion, Mr. Speaker, let me be clear. The funding for this program will be drawn down from the previously announced $150 million capital program. Mr. Speaker, these projects specifically target failed or obsolete systems that can be replaced without major disruption to the daily operations at Times Bay and will be integrated into the overall refurbishment works to avoid wasted expenditure. These upgraded systems are intended to assimilate seamlessly with the larger refurbishment works. This stabilization program includes the replacement of the two overhead refuse cranes, the low voltage switchgear system, the high voltage switchgear systems, two auxiliary transformers, the flue gas monitoring equipment, turbine overhaul, and various instruments associated with the feed water tank system and seawater band screens. Additionally, this program will refurbish the top sections of both flues, the opening of the smooth chimneys. The estimated program length is set at about at three years, with the tendering process for this stabilization program already started and works intended to begin within the first quarter of 2023. Mr. Speaker, Colleagues are informed of the urgent nature of this program as due to supply chain issues, delivery times of 20 to 30 months is anticipated for specialized equipment and this delay will pose a significant operational risk to the facility. Mr. Speaker, you will be familiar with the exercise of trash bailing during extended periods of partial or full plant inoperability. During the execution of these works, it is not expected that they will directly cause any bailing to be required. However, technical officers have curated a garbage bailing contingency plan if such an event arises. Two prepared areas are available for bail storage if required, a Times Bay contingency yard and an overflow site at Marsh Folly. Mr. Speaker, colleagues can be assured that all bales shall be returned to Times Bay for proper disposal. The program will see five projects completed by the end of the fiscal year 2023-24 and one project, project to be completed by the end of fiscal year 24-25. The project contracts will be placed for all six projects in the current fiscal year with an individual project cost being spread over three fiscal years totaling the estimated $22 million. The Estimated funding per year required is 2022 to 23, $7 million, 23 to 24, $14 million, and 24, 25, $1 million. Mr. Speaker, during this fiscal year, 
2022-23, the ministry was allocated $3 million towards the refurbishment program, which is substantially less than the required funding to execute maintenance on the facility. To execute the stabilization program, there's a requirement for an additional $7 million worth of capital investment this current fiscal year, 22-23. The remaining funds are set to be requested through the 2023-24 budget process under the previously authorized $150 million overall refurbishment program as detailed above. Mr. Speaker, colleagues shall recall the national disruption caused by the inoperability of the Times Bay Waste to Energy Facility and the unfortunate alternatives faced due to circumstances in November 2021, whereas, the course of several, whereas over the course of several weeks, approximately 410 tons of refuse was landfilled at the March Folly facility, contrary to good practice and previous public commitments to avoid a repeat of this practice. Mr. Speaker, I want to stress in the strongest possible terms that the risk of a cat catastrophic failure is very real. The plant has a number of issues that threaten the functionality of the plant, particularly the single overhead refuse crane which if it fails will render the plant inoperable and the bailing of trash will be inevitable. Bailing will also have to be performed in another location with garbage diverted to this new site along with storage. Every effort is being made to replace the broken crane as soon as possible. It is anticipated that with funding dedicated for the stabilization works over the next two fiscal years, to procure the critical parts for the facility mentioned above, the Times Bay team can focus their efforts on the major refurbishment works that will manage the country's waste requirements for the next 25 years. Mr. Speaker, again, I'd like to thank the management and staff of Times Bay, ably led by Mr. Nasir Wade, plant manager, the Ministry of Public Works, and Ministry of Finance for their efforts in ensuring that the Times Bay Waste to Energy Facility Stabilization Program has been implemented. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. The next statement this morning is in the Minister in the name of the Minister of Social Development and Seniors, Minister Furbeck. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to inform this Honorable House and the general public of the progressive steps being made to formalize the Gender Affairs Council. According to the United Nations, any gender council has a basic moral and strategic imper imperative to ensure that all people, regardless of their gender, can realize their full potential. Mr. Speaker, some may, be, may recall in 2008, the government officially added gender equity to the Department of Human Affairs mandate, and approval was granted to establish an equity council for Bermuda. Mr. Speaker, in 2010, the then Ministry of Cultural and social rehabilitation established a non-statutory body, a women's council, under the former leadership of the Honorable Nalitha Butterfield. This women's council was established to focus on improving the quality of life for women, families, and society. The council had been charged to address urgent issues highlighted in a 1997 women's issue report, such as equal pay, workplace sexual harassment, maternity leave, marriage licenses, and violence against women. Also in the year 2010, Mr. Speaker, the government engaged in the process to have United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, extended to Bermuda. CEDAW is a landmark international agreement that affirms principles of fundamental human rights and equality for women around the world, and is often referred to as the Women's Bill of Rights. Consisting of a preamble and 30 articles, this convention defines what constitutes discrimination against women and sets up an agenda for national action to end gender discrimination. On the 16th of March, 2017, the United Kingdom extended CEDAW to Bermuda. In 2015, with the dissolution of the Department of Human Affairs, individuals were never appointed to the Women's Council and the body remained inactive to this date. So, Mr. Speaker, in keeping with global practice and the modern dynamics of gender politics, this government has made the commitment to the establishment of a gender affairs council that incorporates the philosophical, 
the last <laughs> philosophical <laughs> shift that individuals in our community can reap the gender benefits that are system systematic, inclusive, and sustainable. Mr. Speaker, the importance and relevance of gender-based issues has been prominent in our small community. These issues have included domestic violence, employment, increasing poverty, burden of care, sexual orientation, political representation, economic opportunity, and safety and security. Mr. Speaker, over the years, Bermuda has seen a drastic increase in gender-based domestic violence rates, which is concerning. In 2020, the Director of Public Prosecutions revealed that 30% of cases were domestic related. Additionally, in 2020, the Center Against Abuse shared that they have experienced a sharp increase in domestic abuse reports between 2018 and 2020. There was close to an 88% increase in abuse reports, with 91 reported in 2018, 161 reported in 2019, and 171 reported in 2020. Mr. Speaker, there are also economic and employment gender-related issues, which unfortunately leads to further disparity in Bermuda. In 2020, on average, the median gross annual income by sex shows women earned 68,294 per year, compared to 61,946,000 for men, representing a 9.7% difference in pay. In 2021, the Bermuda Job Market Employment Brief illustrated a widening in the earnings gap between the genders. Mr. Speaker, although these are just a few examples of gender-based issues that Bermuda faces, the government understands the relevance and importance of working towards resolving them. The Gender Affairs Council will assist government in an advisory capacity to bring perceptions, experience, and interests of women and men to influence legislation, policy, and decision-making. This is key to driving change towards a more productive, profitable, and equitable culture to improve society. It demonstrates the government's commitment to issues on gender balance as it relates to employment, economic opportunity, safety, and security. Mr. Speaker, the newly established Gender Affairs Council will be comprised of individuals representing government agencies, civil society organizations, and entrepreneurs. Mr. Speaker, many of, many of you may have seen the press conference I held on Wednesday the 21st. The press conference was also used to provide the importance of establishing a gender affairs council and the overarching re remit of the council. This press conference also provided an opportunity for me to encourage individuals to submit an expression of interest so that they can be considered to serve on this non-statutory body that will drive change to, to a more equitable community. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to receiving expressions of interest, and I want to thank our community in advance for their support, interest, and com commitment to what the government seeks to achieve. I encourage individuals in our community who wish to serve on the Gender Affairs Council and be part of the progressive change to submit an expression of interest form by October 7, 2022. The form must be submitted electronically and can be accessed online at forms.gov.bm slash department slash the cabinet office slash expression of interest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. I believe the next statement is also in your name. Yes. Thank Continue you, Mr. On. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. I rise today to inform this honorable house and the general public about an exciting initiative, Nurturing Our Nation Imperfect Parenting Series that provides an opportunity for the Ministry of Social Development and Seniors, the Department of Child and Family Services, and industry professionals to collaborate in providing resources that are designed to assist families. Mr. Speaker, DCFS conducts quarterly family strengths and needs assessments on all families engaged in intervention services with the department. Annual data gathered from these assessments indicate that two of the highest priority areas of need for most primary caregivers are the need for support in the areas of coping and parenting skills. Being aware of this need within the community the Ministry of Social Development and Seniors and DCFS was keen to find a way to ensure primary caregivers were given the support and tools to help them strengthen themselves as parents and guardians. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry 
and the Department of Child and Family Services collaborated with industry professionals to develop this in initiative, Nurturing Our Nation in Perfect Parenting Series, to provide valuable resources and connections through live stream panel discussions, focus groups, and a parenting expo. The purpose of this initiative is to educate primary caregivers and assist them in providing practical solutions, such as coping and parenting skills that enables community development. Mr. Speaker, Nurturing Our Nation in Perfect Parenting Series panel discussions are held twice a month, starting at 12.30 p.m., live on Facebook, Bermuda Government Twitter, Bermuda Government YouTube, and CITV Bermuda. One Communications Channel 2 and WOW Channel 102. The first panel discussion was held on Wednesday, the 22nd of September, which panelists discussed and answered questions on the topic of routines. Mr. Speaker, the upcoming live stream panel discussion schedule is as follows. Boundaries, which we held uh, yesterday, was Thursday, September 29th. The effects of bullying and domestic violence on children, Thursday, October 20th, co-parenting and nurturing parents on Thursday, October 27th, personal care and wellness on Thursday, November 17th, nutrition and meal planning on Thursday, November 24th. I reiterate, these discussions will start at 1230 on all government of Bermuda virtual platforms and CITV. And I encourage members in our community sub to submit questions to the email address asks at gov.bm before discussion dates to add to what I believe will be a wholesome discussion. Mr. Speaker, the panelists that will be participating in the panel discussions include representatives from numerous government departments and community organizations, namely the Department of Child and Family Services, Child Development Program, Department of Health, Bermuda Police Service, the Family Center, the Coalition for Protection of Children, Parent Guide, Teleconnect, Psych New Wellness, Center Against Abuse, Women's Resource Center, Ocean Rock Wellness, and Beyond Therapy. Mr. Speaker, I encourage parents, guardians, grandparents, and other members of our community who are part of a family support village to watch these panel discussions Many times parents, guardians, caregivers feel helpless trying to cope with their children and think issues their children or family is experienced is in isolation. But this is not true. You are not alone. Many parents, guardians, and families, regardless of factors such as race, sex, educational background, religious denomination, and financial status have similar experiences when raising a child. These similar experiences could be, for example, not being able to cope at times, finding home and work-life balance, unaware of the support resources within the community, and not being able to communicate with your child. Mr. Speaker, I would like to take this opportunity to remind parents and guardians that we are not perfect and we will all make mistakes when parenting a child. We must remember not to be hard on ourselves and also not to be judgmental of others. Parenting is definitely not easy. However, I believe this initiative will provide awareness of information, support, and services that is readily available in the community that can assist with coping and enhancing positive parenting skills. Mr. Speaker, as stated earlier, the Nurturing Our Nation Imperfect Parenting Series includes a parenting expo. This expo will have vendor participants that represent various industry professionals from government, department agencies, and community organizations. These participants provide community programs, child development support and services, mental health support and services, parent support, education support, and extracurricular activities. The Parenting Expo will be held Thursday, November 10th, 2022, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. on the front lawn of City Hall in Hamilton. Please save the date and look out for further information that will be announced in the media and on social media platforms. Mr. Speaker, residents should be receiving a Nurturing Our Nation Imperfect Parenting Series mailer sometime soon. This mailer includes the panel discussion schedule and monthly parenting tips, which I believe will be useful in educating primary caregivers. The parenting tips can provide ways for not just the primary caregiver to enhance themselves and other caregivers, but also to suggest ways to engage and encourage your child. I recommend you try to use the tips in your daily routine. 
Mr. Speaker, the government remains committed to our parents, children, and families, and recognizes that there are gaps in level of awareness some prime, for some primary caregivers. Many of the caregivers in our community can truly benefit from sessions to assist with coping strategies, parenting skills, and attaining community support. I believe nurturing our nation in perfect parenting series will help to close some of the existing gaps by educating and providing resources to primary caregivers. It is hoped this would allow us to start healing the foundation of our families, the primary caregivers. Once our families experience healing, then they t together we can work collectively to heal our nation. In closing, the quote by Art Solomon, initial elder, comes to mind. To heal a nation, we must first heal the individuals, the families, and the communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank, thank you, Minister. The next statement this morning is in the name of the Minister of National Security. Minister, would you like to put your statement? Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to provide an update on the Bermuda Fire Rescue Service Airport Operations Division. Mr. Speaker, you will recall that I made a statement to this Honorable House on the 1st of July of this year advising of the revised requirements for the Bermuda Fire Rescue Service at the airport. Mr. Speaker? Um, Mr. Time, uh, one sec, Minister. Me just to remind, we're back in chambers. Could have come around. You crossing the line. Crossing the line. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, at that time, I advised that the Bermuda Fire Rescue Service operates the airport rescue firefighting services, which provides aircraft rescue and firefighting services for the ILF Red International Airport. This is an essential service that enables the airport to serve commercial flights. Mr. Speaker, you will recall that Skyport is the ILF Red International Airport's aerodrome certificate holder. The certificate is issued by the Bermuda Civil Aviation Authority to Skyport and enables them to operate the airport. One of the many regulated activities under the certification is the airport rescue firefighting services. Mr. Speaker, as previously advised, the airport rescue firefighting services is a retained government service as part of the airport project agreement between Skyport and the Bermuda Airport Authority. The Bermuda Airport Authority is responsible for providing the retained government service and have transferred responsibility for the delivery of the airport rescue firefighting services to the Bermuda Fire Rescue Service by way of a memorandum of understanding in 2007 with an amendment in 2017. There is no fee paid by by Skyport to the Bermuda Airport Authority or to the Bermuda Fire and Rescue Service for this service. Mr. Speaker, I wish to remind my honorable colleagues that since 1995, the accepted minimum duty strength at the airport required three crews of five firefighters per shift. This enabled the airport to provide a response category rating of nine. A rating of nine is required for large commercial jets including British Airways, Boeing 777 aircraft service to Bermuda. Mr. Speaker, a February 2002 Skyport audit of the Airport Operations Division recommended increasing firefighter minimum duty strength from five per crew to 14 in order to maintain a Category 9 response rating for the airport. Mr. Speaker, the Bermuda Airport Authority retained a UK Civil Aviation Authority rescue firefighting expert to review the recommended requirements, including the minimum duty strength. The expert has completed his on-island review, and his report is being used for further discussion with Skyport and the Bermuda Civil Aviation Authority on a minimum duty strength requirements at the airport. Mr. Speaker, in the interim, Ten overseas firefighters were brought in as a temporary measure to ensure that the airport continued to operate as normal. However, the numbers only provided for us to maintain 
a Category 7 rating. In order to provide a surge for the British Airways flight, staff are required to come back in on their rest days and do excessive overtime. Mr. Speaker, this was not a sustainable short-term solution and put an unfair strain on firefighters who could not take leave or even a rest day. In order to maintain sufficient firefighters at the airport, an additional 25 firefighters are being contracted from overseas from October until the end of March 2023. This will enable the service to maintain the interim minimum duty strength without excessive overtime and burnout of our local firefighters. It will allow local firefighters to take their leave and rest days. Mr. Speaker, the cost of this surge in 35 firefighters through to the end of March is anticipated to be approximately $2.75 million. I want to make it clear that the overseas firefighters are here on a short-term contract, and their package reflects that fact. It includes return flights, housing, and a base monthly fee paid in arrears. Their monthly fee equates to the lowest monthly rate for a local firefighter. They are responsible for registering and paying taxes. Whilst they receive two days off per month, they do not receive the same benefits as local firefighters who benefit not only from full-time employment, but annual leave, sick leave, maternity or paternity leave, parental leave, bereavement leave, long service leave, lieu leave, special personal leave, public holidays, pension benefits, retirement benefit, medical benefits, dental benefits, and a telephone allowance. Mr. Speaker, we are very fortunate to have been able to secure the services of the overseas firefighters in such short order in order to maintain uninterrupted flight operations at the airport. Mr. Speaker, I can confirm that the airport rescue and firefighting services continue to be, to be provided in accordance with approvals provided by the Bermuda Civil Aviation Authority as these changes are taking place. I can further confirm that the level of airport rescue and firefighting services meets the requirements of Bermuda's commercial airlines operators, and no flights have been canceled due to the ongoing changes. Mr. Speaker, Bermuda Fire Rescue Services' goal is to successfully complete all of the required changes to the Airport Operations Division to ensure there are sustainable resources to maintain the recommended airport rescue and firefighting services. Mr. Speaker, once we have agreed the final minimum duty strength requirements for the airport, we will look at all options for meeting those requirements, and as promised, I will provide an update to this Honorable House at that time. In the interim, 11 local persons are being hired from November to train as airport-rated firefighters, and their training will be completed by the end of March 2023. Mr. Speaker, in closing, I would like to thank the women and men of the Bermuda Fire and Rescue Service for their service, and in particular, to those who have stepped up at the airport to meet this challenge. I would also like to thank the executive of the Fire Service Association for their support in this matter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. The next statement, the final statement this morning, is in the name of the Minister of Economy and Labor. Minister, would you like to present your statement? Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. I am elated to rise today to present to this Honorable House on the initiatives government has undertaken to promote and support our youth. Mr. Speaker, a strong economy hinges upon people having the skills they need to secure meaningful, well-paid work. The flagrant consequences of youth unemployment highlight the importance of making good job options available for our young people. As part of our youth employment strategy, we are making a deliberate effort to target and upskill our youth as they play a vital part in the workforce in the coming years. 
Our goal is to position them to secure employment opportunities. Mr. Speaker, in the next quarter, the Department of Workforce Development will be engaging with stakeholders to implement initiatives as outlined in the National Youth Employment Strategy. In alignment with Goal 1 of the strategy, which is to increase local training opportunities and promote pathways to securing employment, a working group comprised of members from the public and private sector as well as youth stakeholders have been engaged to analyze labor market data to ensure training opportunities align with current and future demand. Mr. Speaker, to ensure relevant training and education opportunities are available locally, the group will perform analysis on the following to identify high demand occupations and professions with low Bermudian participation. Capacity across various industries to identify the need for entry-level jobs to ensure youth services and programs are aligned, non-traditional conventional training opportunities, and capture data on Bermuda school leavers ages 18 to 26 that will include their education, career interests, area of study, projected completion date, career goals, and employment status. Each of these steps strives to ensure that young Bermudians are suitably qualified and positioned to take advantage of job opportunities within the local market. Mr. Speaker, the graduate training program was implemented in 2021 with much success. The program provides paid work experience for 21 unemployed recent Bermuda College and University graduates in their area of study. I am pleased to report applications for the next cohort of the graduate trainees will open on September 23rd, 2022. Interested persons can apply through the Bermuda Job Board at www.bermudajobboard.bm. Information has already been released on various media platforms. However, persons have, rendered, have the remainder of today to complete an application if they are interested. Participants of the program will gain relevant work experience in their area of study, opportunity to refine their soft skills, and one-on-one -on -one coaching as they navigate their career journey. The Department of Workforce Development is engaging with private sector employers to expand apprenticeships and register their apprenticeship opportunities with the department. The apprenticeship scheme affords mentorship support, education, paid on-the-job training, and experience professional development opportunities and sponsorship benefits. These programs speak directly to goal four of the strategy, which ensures that a greater number of our young people receive relevant work experience to better prepare them for gainful employment. Mr. Speaker, goal five of the strategy is to improve public access to relevant labor market information and career opportunities. The work of the Labor Market Review Working Group will be translated into clear, digestible formats through social media, marketing ads, and other forms of communications to better connect with young people. Ensuring access to this information promotes strategic and informed decisions when choosing a career path. Data gathering is a two-way street. Unfortunately, over the past several years, we have not been able to ascertain where our young people are studying for their tertiary education, what degrees they are pursuing, and their projected graduation date. The Department of Workforce Development will make upgrades to the Bermuda Job Board to collect this data by the end of this fiscal period. This data will be used to project capacity in the job market. Mr. Speaker, it is now well known that entrepreneurship can be a viable option in terms of job satisfaction and overcoming difficulties in finding employment. As the BEDC is actively supporting and growing Bermuda's entrepreneurial ecosystem, BEDC has developed programs to help our young people succeed in jobs and entrepreneurship. The BEDC's Summer Employment Summer Student Entrepreneurship Program launched in 2018 is building Bermuda's next generation entrepreneurs. To date, it has seen entrepreneurs between the ages of 13 and 24 bring over 50 new jobs to the market, solidifying entrepreneurship as a viable career choice. Mr. Speaker, as a young person, there is nothing more exciting than competition. 
to create an environment where constructive competition in the business market is encouraged. The BEDC's annual youth pitch competition inspires youth between the ages of 14 and 18 to develop and pitch a business idea. Many students have pitched entrepreneurial ideas, with some continuing on to start their own business in Bermuda. Since launching BEDC's Enterprise Bermuda Incubator Program in 2018, 30 startups have been incubated, bringing 80 new jobs to market. BDC's new startup payroll tax relief program launched in 2018-2019 has facilitated 85 businesses, bringing 150 new jobs to the market. The number of persons seeking a vending license from the BEDC has increased with 322 vending licenses being approved since 2020. A number of these include licenses approved for our young people. Mr. Speaker, the initiative shared highlights this government's effort to encourage and develop our youth to enable them to thrive and experience fruitful lives within our community. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Department of Workforce Development and the BEDC for the work they are doing to help us get our young people working. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. That members brings us to the end of the statements for this morning. I mean, thank you for your contributions. We now move on. The next item on the order paper is reports of committees. There are none. Brings us to the question period. And there are written questions which will be carried for the moment. And then we'll go to the statement questions from statements this morning. Ministers, the statements this morning have one, two, not many questions, but we do have some questions. And we'll start this morning, Premier. There are questions for you on your statement from the opposition leader. Opposition leader, would you like to put your question now? Thank you very much. Um, in regards to the statement to Prague, just two questions came to mind for me while um, his statement was being presented. Um, while in the EU and meeting with the shakers and movers of the EU, has the, minister, um, the Premier considered discussing with the EU immigration um, eases that would allow Bermudians to easily uh, study in, the, in Europe, in addition, help them find internships in Europe that will help Bermuda's IB in the long run. He, 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 combined, he combined two questions there. But, um, Premier, we can separate it or you could answer them together. How's that? <laughs> you, can, you, you can answer it in a, a single response. It's two easy questions. They were difficult ones. I might have had them separate them up. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I thank the Honorable Opposition Leader for his questions. Uh, those have not uh, been uh, matters that are particularly canvassed mm -hmm. with the uh, European Union, but I'm happy to take uh, the suggestion on board. Uh, the person who, uh, the Bermudian who runs our Brussels office, uh, Ms. Aliyah Ahad, actually prior to her work, uh, did significant work on European migration studies and happy to pass a recommendation on to her and happy to revert back to the opposition leader on what um, is actually in place and if he has any further suggestions for possible enhancements. Thank you. Supplementary? No. no. Further question? Yes. Continue. On the same one. Um, on page two, the minister, uh, the premier indicated that he spoke to Elena Bardrum, the director for international affairs and climate. And what jumped to mind for me, Mr. Speaker, is this question. Did the premier encourage Ms. Bardem to advocate on behalf of Bermuda to the EU states to support and sign the Hamilton Declaration and ultimately become a member of the Sargasso Sea Alliance. I'm saying that because when I was the Minister of the um, Environment, I was working with Ireland, which is an EU state, and encouraged them to become a signatory on the Hamilton Declaration. 
and become a member of the Sagasso Sea Alliance. So I was wondering if he would also examine the possibility of having EU members support and become a signatory in the Hampton Declaration. So, so the question is, will the EU members, will he seek to have the EU members support and sign the document? Okay. Just wanted to wrap it up in a same question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I've been informed by the Honorable Deputy Premier that those discussions were held with various EU member states at uh, the uh, Global Climate Conference COP26, which took place last year in Glasgow. Um, and I will ensure that um, any follow-up discussions that I have with climate as they are regular interactions, we'll make sure that that is included. That was not raised in that particular meeting, but I'm um, happy to make sure that that is done on forward matters. Thank you. Supplementary? Uh, additional question? No, thank you. Okay. Premier, you also have questions on your second statement, and those questions are getting from the opposition leader. Opposition leader, we'll take your question. Thank you very much. Um, to start with the, I think, the easier question first. Um, the minister, the um, Premier indicated that there were a number of um, positive variances in regards to the budget. And um, I was looking to see if he had applied some of the positive variances to actually reducing our debt. So I'd like to speak to him in re and have further clarification as to is it his intentions to apply some of the positive variants to um, a plan to reduce the debt? Thank you. That was pretty straightforward. One single question. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I do believe that the answer to the Honorable Opposition Leader's question um, as mentioned inside the statement that noted that Bermuda's gross debt has decreased due to our refinancing activities, that our deficit um, is smaller. But I think it's important to note that we are still in deficit. And until we make it to the point of having a balanced budget, then that is the time where we need to reduce the debt. The government has set out its plan to make sure that we return to a balanced budget. But I think what is also important and is recognized in the statement is that we need to, while maintaining our budget targets, make the necessary investments which are, ne which are needed to support the people of this country. You would heard me say in the statement about the additional investments that are being made in affordable housing mm -hmm. to ensure that more housing can be provided, the investments of which and the relief that is being provided to the citizens of this country with further relief to come. And I think that that is the best way to make sure that we manage the economy. We will get to a space for balanced budget. We set out our long-term plans in accordance with the fiscal responsibility panel, setting a target that was laid out in the budget statement to return to get ourselves to a $50 million budget surplus over the next few fiscal years. And, but it is important that while we are on this trajectory to maintain budget discipline while also providing relief to Bermudians who are under pressure due to global inflation. Thank you. Supplementary or a new question? Go ahead. Um, thank you. Mr. Speaker, uh, the Minister of Finance indicated that the revenue projected um, to be 1.27 was basically um, $74 million above the original estimates. And he said it was primarily due to customs, stamp duty, civil aviation, payroll tax, and increased revenue from travel authorization. Can the Minister of Finance provide the dollar values attributed to these um, ministries in regards to the um, positive variances? So in other words, they said the um, increased revenue was due to customs, stamp duty, civil aviation, payroll tax, and travel authorization. Can he attribute dollar values to each of those um, revenue sources. Premier. Mr. Speaker, happy to do so for the honorable member. Uh, the variance from, from original estimates to the revised uh, estimates and final estimates for customs duties was $23,901,000 and $901,373. The variance on stamp duty was $13,052,640. The variance on payroll tax was $8.8 .8 million, and the variance in regards to the additional 
funds received from civil aviation above budget targets was $10,881,000 and the travel authorization fee was above budgeted expectations by $8,850,000. Thank you. Supplementary? Yes. Um, along the same line, he also indicated that the there was a $5 million increase projection on the interest and guaranteed management, co um, guaranteed management costs. Can he break down the details of the increased costs attributed to the increased cost of our interest rates as well as um, the breakdown on the costs attributed to the failed Mogus Point project? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. During the 2021-2022 budget year, there was no increased interest rate costs that were there. Our interest rates were uh, fixed, and there was no variance during that uh, year to uh, the best of my knowledge, and I think that was covered inside the budget statement. In regards to a detailed breakdown of the matters for Morgan's Point, I do not have that in front of me, but I think it stands to state that the Morgan's Point project has cost the Treasury more than $240 million, as outlined in the budget statement uh, mm -hmm. prior. That number may uh, be a little bit high, but I know it's over $200 million, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'm happy that the honorable member can go ahead and write for specific questions. Happy to give him a breakdown on all the costs for Morgan's Point. And also, as chairman of the Public Accounts Committee, I'm sure that he can call a hearing if he wants to find out more about how money is being spent to the taxpayers' money that should be able to be used for the taxpayers, but is instead being used to bail out and to finance a project that was guaranteed by the former government, Mr. Speaker. Over $200 million that could be spent on Bermudians, relief for Bermudians, this government had to go ahead, access the market, and to provide that cover for a project, Mr. Speaker, that I've said in this honorable house was in default before the election of 2017. Supplement, um, you, you, you used two supplementaries. You can do a new question. Turn your mic on. My second question is this. Um, the, the statement says interest and guarantee. And it also goes on to say that, that most of this increase is related to Morgan's Point. The Speaker, sorry, the Minister of Finance said there was no increase in the uh, interest expense. So is he now saying that his, this statement is incorrect because there is no interest or uh, increase based on his response to my question, and that all of this $5 million was attributable to Morgan's point. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Speaker, the statement is correct. Not all of it was attributed to Morgan's point. There's other breakdowns. The government manages various guarantees. And happy to give the honorable member a breakdown. I do not have it in front of me. If he so requests and requires it, he could have also had it during the budget statement. And if he looks in the budget book, it might also be publicly available. So I don't have a budget book beneath me, but if I look online or if the honorable member looks online, he'll be able to find because those matters were detailed in the budget. Supplementary? Supplementary, I'm moving on to the... Supplementary on the same question or a new question? New question. Hey, third question there, your third question. Yes, um, in regards to the debt refinancing, can the minister provide details on who the runners were or the brokers who managed the um, refinancing in the capital markets and how much did we pay them in dollar value and as a percentage of the capital raise. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, to the best of my recollection, the uh, joint book runners for the uh, debt raise was um, HSBC and Goldman Sachs, I do believe. And I do not have the information in front of me um, in regards to uh, the cost, but happy to provide that uh, to the honorable member. If he goes ahead and writes specific details, if he wish, I'm happy to go ahead and provide it. It may have been provided in the uh, statement of which I made in July. Um, if it was not provided in the statement that it was made in July, happy to provide that information. It was a standard uh, cost following a tender, which goes out um, in accordance with OPMP guidelines and was approved by the cabinet. Okay. Supplementary? No further questions. Thank you for your contribution on that statement. The next statement that members have indicated they have questions is for the Deputy Premier, your statement on the fuel 
Beal. MP Cannonier, so I can put your question. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning, colleagues. Um, on page five, uh, unfortunately, my uh, tablet is not working well. Uh, on page five, going through to page six, um, the Honorable Deputy Premier mentions service to the people of Bermuda is the single greatest purpose of this bill. Uh, later on in that paragraph, it speaks of regulations will not be derived in a vacuum, but rather for some discussion with the industry. Um, and then he qualifies that with the following, I must add clarity and assurances in the matter of pricing. And so my question was, um, the previous uh, paragraph on page five speaks to, speaks to, yes, I declare my interest, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the previous uh, paragraph states that um, there will be fulsome discussion. Uh, but it doesn't identify that uh, with the regulatory authority that the government and duty was, is going to be included in that. I'm assuming that as a fulsome, as it mentions here, uh, a fulsome uh, look at the whole process will be done, and I'm assuming that uh, uh, the duty uh, on fuel will be a part of that process. Is that the case? Deputy? Yes, Mr. Yes, Mr. Speaker. But that will discussion on duty will be had with the Ministry of Finance. Okay. Supplementary? Uh, new question? Um, yes, yeah. <laughs> A supplement answer to that. Yes. Uh, okay. Considering that uh, to be the case, uh, is it an ongoing discussion at present then that uh, we should be reducing the duty uh, on fuel and to be transparent? Uh, about it, we know that in the pricing of fuel, uh, especially fossil fuel, the greatest uh, part of that uh, and the one who makes the most is government off of the duty of fuel. Um, Deputy? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me just remind the House that it was the former government that substantially Increase the duty on fuel. Which point of order, Mr. Speaker. Point, point, point of order, order. Speaker. Point of order. I ask a very clear question that has nothing to do with the past. It has to do with the present. Not running from the record. I said it transparent. We know that government, whichever government it has been, the greatest gain has been by government. So no if you can be specific, no problem. Need to politic. It's a simple question. No problem. Respond. I would hope, Mr. Speaker, as long as I'm stating facts, I am within the rules of answering the question. You, 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 government you, 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 you can state your facts and then answer the right? question. But I'm answering the question. Okay. It relates to duty on fuel, Mr. Mm -hmm. Speaker. Uh -huh. And this government is moving forward to um, review the duty Sorry. and to perhaps be able to bring it down over time. But I can only state facts, Mr. Speaker. I'm not trying to add anything else to the question of the honorable member. <laughs> sup, sup, <laughs> supplementary? Supplementary? No. no. Okay. Thank you. Um, members, the next question, the next statement that has questions this morning is a statement by the Minister of National Security. Minister, you have a question from MP Dunkley. MP Dunkley, would you like to put your question now? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning to you, colleagues, and the listening audience. To the Honorable Minister, Honorable Minister, in your statement, at the bottom of page two, you read that in February 2022, the Skyport Audit of the Airport Operations Division recommended increasing firefighter minimum duty strength from five to 14 in order to maintain the Category 9. Honorable Minister, the question to you is, when did the conversations first start in regards to an increase in duty minimum strength? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I understood the question right, I would think that the conversation started right after the audit was complete as to an increase of the um, duty minimum strength. Supplementary? Yes, supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question is, so prior to that audit, there was no indication by Skyport or any other uh, body connected with the airport that there would be the potential 
need to increase the minimum strength. Minister. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure of what the conversations were prior, but as, as um, you know how ordered to go, um, the, audit, the audit to us was hired, and they came in and, and did a review of the airport and the airport operations, and this is what they came up with. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in all due respect, that doesn't answer the question. The answer, to the question was simple. Prior to that audit, was there any indication that there would be an increase of minimum strength, yes or no? He, he was pretty precise, precise on that, Minister. It was, where, had the conversation taking place prior, or any knowledge prior? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, not to my knowledge. I don't know one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Supplementary? Uh, yes, yeah, supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Um, on the next page, the top of page three, the Honorable <laughs> Minister uh, says that the Bermuda Airport Authority has retained a U.K. civil authority rescue fighting, firefighting expert to review the recommended requirements. And that report will be used for further discussions with Skyport and the Bermuda Civil Aviation on the minimum duty strength. Question, Mr. Speaker, does, is the government confident that the results of that report will be accepted by both parties? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The answer, the simple answer is yes. Supplementary, supplementary Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. We take a supplementary, yes. Yes, um, Minister, when you were negotiating the construction of the new airport, what was the um, outline of the fire services and whether or not we were going to have the amount of qualified people that we should have? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for that question, um, MP. Uh, from my understanding, when the negotiations were going on, in reference to the building of the new airport, the fire service was overlooked as to their minimum duty strength. Okay. Supplementary, anyone? No supplementary? supplementary? Yes, I have a supplementary. Good yes. morning, Mr. Speaker. Yes. I'm just curious, um, what negotiations were, were um, MP De Silva from constituency 29 talking about? Okay. The, the, the question. No, no. Question, well, question. well, then I can direct it to the yeah, minister. Direct it all matter. questions. Direct all questions to a minister, a member of cabinet, rather than a backbencher. So I'd like to ask the minister, Mr. Speaker, yes. if um, he might be able to give us some information around what negotiations they're talking about. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Um, speaker, unfortunately, I cannot answer for for someone else. Um, I, 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 hold up, hold up. I think that you attempt, that you did answer the first question that was put by Minister, by Member De Silva, which means you exposed yourself to not have to answer the second question. Okay. Had um, you said that reply that you're given now, had you given that reply to Minister, De, to Member De Silva, you'll be clear. But before, because of the fact that you responded to the, minister, to the member's question first, mm -hmm. you now have to continue responding because you no set yourself up to respond. Mr. Speaker, no problem at all. Would you ask that question again? Yes, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> I'd like to ask the minister if he could please, um, please let us know what negotiations um, they are referring, referring to. to. Okay. Minister. Um, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was the negotiations to build a new airport under a form of government. <laughs> uh, supplementary, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> a supplementary. Thank you. Um, uh, Minister Weeks, can you tell us who was the minister at the time? <laughs> minister. Mr. Speaker. Um, Memory serves me right. I cannot tell you who the minister was, but I can tell you that minister was under the OBA government. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary? No supplementaries. Any additional questions? Yes, additional Speaker, questions. Now that the mischief has ended, let me get back to business here. <laughs> this is your second question, sir. So the, the Honorable Member. 
the honorable member on the other side had some some good breakfast this morning. He's full of himself, but the lunch will probably calm him down. Mr. Speaker, my well, we, we my can second. just stick to the we can just stick to the question. Yeah, the question. Excuse me, I had milk with my breakfast That's too. Right. Cheerios and Dunkley's milk. Good, good. No problem. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, my second question is: the honorable minister in the bottom of page three says that the cost of this surge in 35 firefighters through the end of March is anticipated to be 2.7 million. Mr. Speaker, the question to the Honorable Minister, does the Honorable Minister anticipate that there will be a need for further interim firefighters past March 2023? Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I had um, intimated on page, I think it's four, I'm not sure which, which one it is, but we are still in the process of looking at options, Mr. Speaker, and once it is determined um, how many how many firefighters are needed for duty strength, then we would know exactly what we are doing going forward. Hence, this is why the contract is only until March 2023. Supplementary? Yes, yeah, supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Uh, will the Bermuda Fire Rescue Service and the Ministry of National Security require a supplementary estimate to cover this funding? Minister? Yes, Mr. Speaker, um, it's, it, was, it was a situation that was not anticipated. So, um, yes, we would probably need supplementary. Supplementary? Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, supplementary. Uh, my last supplementary on this question. Yes. Uh, the minister, in referring to the benefit package, uh, says that the package for the overseas firefighters includes return flights, housing, and a base monthly fee paid in arrears. Could the Honorable Minister please um, state if the uh, overseas firefighters are provided free housing? Minister? Yes, Mr. Speaker, that's a part of the, um, the package. Okay. Uh, do you use your supplementary? Third, third <coughs> this question. should be your third question. Third question, and there is time in this, Mr. Speaker. Third question, Mr. Speaker. Um, the minister goes on to say that uh, in the benefit package for local firefighters, um, they have the benefit of full-time employment, annual leave, and sick leave. It insinuates that the interim firefighters do not have that. Can the minister please answer yes or no if the overseas firefighters are provided health insurance and sick leave? Minister. No. Supplementary? Um, supplementary question, Mr. Speaker, in yes. terms of manpower. The Honorable Minister said that there were 11 local persons being hired from November to train, and it's anticipated that their training will be completed by March 2023. Does the Honorable Minister um, have in plans for another recruitment drive to hire additional firefighters? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The answer is yes. Right. Supplementary? My last supplementary, Mr. Speaker, yes. Um, at the current time, Mr. Speaker, can the Honorable Minister please inform this Honorable House how far below um, manpower levels the Bermuda Fire Rescue Service is at this time? Minister? I, asked, I think I answered that earlier, Mr. Speaker. Right now, the exact number <coughs> that we are under man has not been determined. So once that is, that exact number is determined, I will bring it to the Honorable House. Thank you. That, thank you. Uh, that brings the close of that question because uh, you used all three of your questions. And actually it brings us to a close of the in members that indicated they had questions for statements today. So I thank you, members, for your... Mr. Specific. Speaker, I had raised a, a question. Oh, yes, I forgot, I forgot you come up. Yes, yes. <laughs> we were discussing something else at the time, but I didn't put it down. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, good morning, um, uh, Mr. Speaker. Good morning, honorable colleagues and uh, to the listening public. Uh, my question relates to the minister's statement uh, wherein on page three, the final paragraph, the honorable minister said the Department of Workforce Development is engaging with private sector employers 
to expand uh, apprenticeships and register their apprenticeship opportunities with the department. Uh, my question, would the Honorable Minister be able to speak to or explain uh, the nature of the engagement with the private sector employers? Minister? Apprenticeships are, are generally given on um, the supply and demand. And so potential apprentices, they will state their area of an interest. And in order to find those individuals' placement, most times we have to do engagement with employers to determine whether or not they have the capacity and the capability of taking on those apprentices. And so that is the nature of the dialogue that happens with the Sergeant private Jeff. sector entities. Yeah, he just put it up. Sergeant Chipper. Um, member, uh, so, supplementary? So, thank you. Supplementary. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Speaker. How many apprenticeships or new apprenticeships uh, have been uh, have been brought about yes. due to this uh, expansion, uh, this new project? Exactly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Minister? Mr. Speaker, I don't have the complete number, and I'll endeavor to get that back to the Minister, but I will speak of one success story. Yeah. We did have a number of uh, apprenticeships um, within Belco, and as and then Belco increased mm -hmm. um, there to a record number of apprentices. Yep. The Department of Workforce Development took on significant commitments, and so 13 of those individuals received partial funding from the Department of Workforce Development at a total of $9,000 per person. And so that is the level of commitment that this government is placing in training and developing our young persons. Thank you. Supp supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Second question. A second question, okay. Uh, yes, uh, uh, the Honorable Minister spoke to the work of the Labor Market Review Working Group on page four of his statement, uh, second paragraph, and uh, would the Honorable Minister be able to explain to this Honorable House uh, what the nature of that work was uh, over the four months since the release of the Youth Employment Strategy? Minister. Mr. Speaker, the work of the Working Group is highlighted in the statement. The, the primary aim of the Working Group was to review labor market information, ensure that it is dissected so that it can be distributed in a digestible manner so that our young persons, career guidance counselors, educators, and parents can clearly understand where opportunities lie, can understand career pathways, can understand what are the entry-level jobs to get somebody to their primary um, desired occupational category. And that information will be disseminated via so social media, at career fairs, within pamphlet format, in all sorts of ways so that we can get that information um, into the households of our residents so that they make informed and knowledgeable decisions about their career paths. Thank you. Supplementary? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sir, I, I have a question. supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Okay. Supplementary? Yes. Um, Minister, um, of I don't believe that. Speak, speak to the chair. Don't speak, believe that speak, for a speak to the chair, member. Speak I'm to, enjoying speak life way. to the fullest. No, no. <laughs> Oh, thank you for that, uh, former Premier Dunkley. <laughs> thank you, that, thank you for that. I'm trying let, to get back again. Let, let's, like have trying number, to get back let's have the your question. Let's have your question. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, we know you're finished. Trust me, we know you're finished, and they know you're finished too. <laughs> question, question. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. But Minister, Minister, obviously this is this initiative is a very um, successful one. Do you anticipate uh, when all these apprentices become full-time employees to increase or at least continue on with this very successful program for the people of this country? Minister? Mr. Speaker, the answer is yes. Um, the ministry will be having discussions within cabinet in terms of expanded funding so that we can provide more funding for youth employment initiatives to the people of this country. Thank you. Um, MP, um, Richard, do you have a third, what was your third, third question? Third question. Thank now, you, yes. Mr. Speaker. Uh, my third question 
uh, relates to the um, the Honorable Minister in his uh, statement has updated us on three of the nine goals in the youth employment strategy. Could he give us a pro uh, progress report on the other five goals? Six. Six. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, this, speaks, this statement pertains to the work that we're doing over the next quarter. And so while movement is happening in the other places, this will be our area of focus, certainly by having um, focused on a number of goals within a certain time period. It means that we are moving forward in a strategic way. And so this is part of our strategic plan as to how we're moving forward, and these are the areas of focus over the next three months. Thank you. Supplementary? Yes, thank you, yes. Mr. Speaker. Uh, when will the Honorable Minister inform this or update this Honorable House on the other six goals? Mr. Mr. Speaker, I endeavor to give quarterly updates as to the initiatives that will be undertaken in those relevant quarters. Thank you. Further supplementary? Yep. No? Uh, no further supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Members? Thank you for your contribution this morning in the question and answer period. That now brings us to the close of that period on our order paper. We we'll now move on. The next item on the order paper is the con con congratulatory and obituary speeches. Would any member like to make a contribution? The uh, Premier? Uh, thank you. Uh, clock is on. Just remind members the clock is there. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, on behalf of all of my honorable colleagues, and I'm certainly, I will um, associate this um, in, in this entire house, if I may, uh, we were certainly deeply saddened of uh, the death of former uh, Senator uh, Mr. Raymond Tannock, as he was family to mm -hmm. us and the Bermuda Progressive yes. Labor Party. Mm -hmm. Mr. Tannock excelled as a well-known businessman and family man while remaining a party stalwart and supporter. His standing amongst the community influenced the leadership to approach him to run the 2003 general election. He became the PLP candidate for position 30. Uh, uh, um, Premier, South. Premier remind, I have to remind you that you can refer to notes rather than read notes. Oh, my apologies. Uh, even for this? Yes. Oh, my. Yes, That's refer to notes. You, you, tough. You can refer to notes. But a practice. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, he, he became the PLP candidate for constituency number 30, uh, Southampton each schedule, and ran a spirited campaign. Um, certainly, Mr. Speaker, um, although uh, missing success by just a few votes, members were proud of his performance, um, and following that election, he served in the other place from 2003 until 2006. Mm -hmm. um, even beyond the years after his appointment, he serves an active and vocal supporter and can always be counted on for advice and counsel. Mr. Speaker, you can tell the measure of a man and how much he was respected in the community by the outpouring at his homegoing service which was attended by a wide cross-section of the community, and he yeah. was certainly given tribute uh, for his service by the Honorable Deputy Premier. And certainly, Mr. Speaker, our prayers uh, remain with his daughter, uh, Barbara, his sons, Raymond, and uh, Christopher, and their family, and certainly um, a uh, man who lived a life well lived. Mm -hmm. If I may, Mr. Speaker, I would also like to ask his Honorable House to send a letter of condolences to the family of one of my constituents, but also one of Bermuda's centenarians um, who passed recently, Ms. Cleve Demelge Davis, um, better known as Cleo. Um, and people would know her as a longtime employee of uh, the Spot Restaurant. Uh, and I was certainly, as she's a centenarian, acts that we associate all members of this honorable house. She did work at Spot for 68 years. Mm. That is how long she worked at that establishment, Mr. Speaker. Uh, finally, Mr. Speaker, um, what I would like to do is also to, if I may, um, extend uh, the condolences uh, to the family of my constituent, uh, Mr. Ranville Wilford Thomas Sr. Uh, he passed away recently in his 80th year, and certainly mm -hmm. our thoughts remain with his family, mm -hmm. uh, Florence, Rohan, Norris, Sean, and David, and his grandchildren. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Premier. Does any other member wish to make a contribution? Uh, MP Keynes, you have your three minutes. If it pleases you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to offer our congratulations to our helping services, to the EMO that, that was led by uh, Minister Michael Weeks. Uh, as you know, last week we went through a – can you hear me, Mr. Speaker? 
I can hear you. I, I had to take a second look because I know you got a tree in it. You look a little different this morning. Yes, sir. I had to make sure it was the right, right brother in there. But my, uh... <laughs> so do you want? Yeah, yeah, yes, Mr. Speaker. Uh, a thanks to the EMO for the work that they that they and the emergency service has done through the, through the storm. Mr. Speaker, obviously, I'd like to declare my interest uh, for the staff of Balco. Mr. Speaker, you know that we have just over 235 members. At the zenith of the storm, Mr. Speaker, there were just over 29,000 Balco customers that were without electricity. And through the leadership of the incident commander, Mr. Nadir Wade, that team and the Balco workers, they were able to get each and every one of those households back on in record time. Mm -hmm. The opportunity was us for a, t a team to work together, but Bermudians in general, as you know, Mr. Speaker, we work together as a storm, and I just would like to acknowledge all of our emergency services and the Balco staff for making sure that Bermuda uh, made it through the storm together. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Does any other member wish to make a contribution? Yes, Mr. Uh, Speaker. De Deputy, Deputy Premier, you have your three minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'd like to pass on condolences to the family of Ms. Mildred Hodgson, a constituent of mine who recently passed away. Um, certainly we, um, those of us in the North Shore community, our hearts are with the family associating um, MP for Constituency 16 Minister Michael Weeks, uh, Mildred, Mildred Hodgson. Uh -huh. um, and I'm associating um, Minister Michael Weeks. Uh -huh. And other members of the House are Minister Wayne Furbert as well with that particular condolence. I'd like to also, on a happier note, bring um, a message of congratulations to Heard AME Church on the Glebe Road, which celebrated their 114th anniversary recently, Mr. Speaker. I was in attendance, but also was Minister Michael Weeks and also Minister David Birch. So we there joined them under the leadership of um, Reverend um, Ralph Trott and also heard a wonderful uh, um, presentation from um, the uh, our presiding elder of the Amy Church, um, Howard Dill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member. Does any other member wish to make a contribution at this time? MP. Uh, from Constituent 28, NP Lister, you were up just a Thank while you, ago. Mr. Speaker. Go ahead. Good morning. Good, Good morning, morning to the House and to the listening public. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd first like to associate myself with the comments um, by the Premier to Mr. Ray McTannock and also NP Keynes to the Belco staff. Um, I just want to add congratulations also, Mr. Speaker. I know it's been a while, um, two months, matter of fact, since cup match, and we haven't been in the House. And I'd like to just send congratulations to the victorious Somerset Cup match team for winning Cup match again. So I, I'd like Mr. To Speaker, I'd like to be associated with Mr. Speaker. Thank you for that time, Mr. Speaker. Was, I'll, 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 the whole house. Ma member, there the was a house. lot of echoing going on at the time. I understand that Audison and George's folks wanted to be a part of that. Congratulations as well. Thank Absolutely. We'll, we'll include Audison and George's folks with everyone else on that one. Um, Minister Weeks, I see you on your feet. You have your three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to start on a positive note and want to be associated with the remark about Harrod Chapel in the 114th anniversary. It was a, it was a good occasion. I was there with um, the Deputy Premier and the Minister of Public Works. And we had a, a, a good time. It was a joyous occasion, a lot of celebration and the like. Mr. Speaker, I'd also like to be associated with the remarks by MP Keynes. I want to um, take my hat off to the EMO staff who, and I, I don't want to call them individuals because I don't want to miss any of them, but the EMO organization are very in tune with, with um, preparing for anything that may happen, i.e. like the hurricanes, and they go over and beyond. And um, I can't say enough about them. I take my hat off to all the EMO staff. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to end on a somber note. I would like, I'd like the House to extend condolences to the family and friends of a 16-year-old, Kanye Ford. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to associate the whole house with this. He tragically lost his life a few weekends ago in an altercation at Horseshoe Bay. It is sad, Mr. Speaker, to lose any life in our community due to a census act, but the loss of such a young life bears a special, a special pain and sorrow. Mr. Speaker, my, my heart goes out to his family, his mother, his father, his sisters, his friends, 
everybody, Mr. Speaker. We, we, I was at the um, fin with a couple of other um, numbers, and it was heart-wrenching to see so many young people up there crying and, 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 um, and the like. So, Mr. Speaker, at this time, I just want to pray. Send those prayers to the community, Mr. Speaker. Send those prayers to our country that we have to get, get on top of this thing to reverse to reverse the situation that we find our country in. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, uh, Minister. Does any other member recognize the opposition leader? You have your three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to send um, congratulatory remarks to the organizers of the new Bermuda Maritime Academy. I saw that in today's newspaper, and I was very moved by it because I think it was overdue, and um, there are opportunities for young people. I know I have a nephew that's in the industry that's doing great things in shipping um, in regards to freighters and ferries overseas. So I would like, on behalf of the House, um, send my congratulatory, congratulatory remarks to the organizers of the Bermuda Maritime Institute. I'd like to also say congratulations to Roydell Neverson. She was appointed as Director of Operations at the Hampton Princess. Um, I think this is a first as far as an international organization in tourism where we have a Bermudian as number two. And so she has served her time. She epitomizes tourism in Bermuda. And it is well, well deserved. And the whole house, the house, the house. I like to associate the all the members in the house on her recent appointment and her and I wish her continued success in the future. I'd like to associate myself with the comments in, made in regards to the EMO staff, the regiment, and so on and so forth, because they've done a sterling job with the hurricane. I'd like to also associate myself with of the death of Senator Raymond Tennant. Um, he was always the consummate gentleman. And irrespective of what side of the fence you were on, he embraced you, welcomed you, listened to you, and engaged with you in only a manner that he can do. So condolences to Barbara, Raymond, and Chris. I'd like to say condolences to the family of one of my constituents, Gilbert Amaral, a jovial person, um, condolences to Donna, his wife, his children, Elizabeth, Teresa, and I think Tamara. Um, I think that is it for me. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I recognize the honorable member uh, from St. George's to get up, I guess, support the congratulations to Somerset, but I'll leave that for her to do. Um, MP Mean, you have your three minutes. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. And Good morning, MP Me. If there's any comments I don't want to be associated with, it'll be those ones. <laughs> but, you know, I wish the team would be best. Um, we know y'all good spirit. Was we know y'all good spirit. There was going to be a loser, <laughs> and it just wasn't the outcome that I had hoped and prayed for. <laughs> but, Mr. Speaker, I rise this morning because I, first of all, um, like to be associated with the comments for Roy Dow Navison. I know she has worked in hospitality for years, and it is, um, I'm sure, a major accomplishment for her to find herself in the second position. I'd also like to acknowledge and congratulate Dion Morrison Shakir on being appointed the Attorney General. Um, just yeah. for, for Content General, sorry. General. Um, it's just um, further confirmation, Mr. Speaker, that not just locally in Bermuda, but globally, you see women stepping up and um, putting themselves in leadership. Um, another congratulations, Mr. Speaker, is for the Seafood Festival that was held in St. George's a few weeks ago. Excuse me. Um, many of you would have heard that it was truly oversubscribed, probably by 400%. <laughs> there was an estimate of approximately 600 mm -hmm. to 800 guests, and they went over 4,000. So great event um, and collaboration between the BTA and the Corporation of St. George's. And um, a hearty thank you to the Bermuda community for coming out and supporting um, something that we hope will become an annual event. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Are you finished, Minister? Remember? Thank you. Um, MP Terrell, you have your three minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning, colleagues. Good morning. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, firstly, let me uh, associate with the remarks on the passing of uh, Raymond Tannock. 
uh, uh, Mr. Tannock and I uh, sat in the other place for a number of years um, under a different. Sure did. He sure did. Uh, and I appreciate his uh, concert, certainly. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, I certainly rise um, to ask, in, in a sad way, to ask if this House can send condolences um, to the following families in my constituency in Warwick who have passed um, recently. The first one uh, was um, um, is to, to the old boy family on uh, the passing of their mother, um, Maybell. <sighs> known as May, uh, oh boy, um, she passed uh, in her 92nd year um, after a bit of a struggle. Um, and so I certainly send my personal con uh, condolences uh, to her sons, Anthony and Derek, and daughters, Laverne, Alana, and Deborah. Uh, the next uh, family I ask if uh, condolences could be sent to uh, it's the family of um, the late Mary Williams. Uh, Ms. Williams is, was formerly of uh, Will, Willview Lane, but latterly uh, went to a, um, um, a care home uh, on her passing. And um, I certainly, uh, um, she was 107, she was in her 107th year. Um, and so she obviously lived a long, a, a long life. And um, my opposition leader my, will be associated. Yes, I associate the opposition leader. Uh, my condolences uh, to our sons, uh, Lloyd and uh, Michael. And finally, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, if I could ask the condolences be sent to the family of the late Fredrina Darrell. Uh, Fredrina was not one of my constituents, but her family, um, headed by Heather Darrell, uh, live in Carver Heights uh, in my constituency. And uh, Fredrina uh, was very close to the family, and I'm sure she'll be missed. And so I ask that um, condolences be sent to her friends and family. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank Speaker. you, MP. Does any other member wish to make a contribution? MP uh, Jackson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would just like to send condolences to the family and friends of Michael Wagner. Uh, he is someone that I have just met recently, so I don't have a long history. Uh, and there's association around the House, uh, yes. and I'd like to include members. Mm -hmm. I met him more recently, and he, is a he was a constituent who was living in a wheelchair after an accident earlier in life. And I certainly enjoyed my visits with him. He was such an affable, friendly, and uh, considerate young, young man. He was a peer my age. Um, but I did also find out later on that he had lived such a fulsome life. He was uh, a counselor at Whitney Institute. He was a, a very active member at Young Life, which was a Christian-based social uh, organization for young people. Um, Mr. Wagner also had an opportunity to do some schooling in the Azores, and he also worked uh, down in St. Croix. So. I'd like to celebrate all of the fulsomeness of his life, um, but it is a very sad time, and we will miss him very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Any other? I recognize the Minister of Transport. Minister, you have your three minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise uh, to ask this House to give a letter of cond or send a letter of condolence to uh, Mr. Marcus Wilson, who uh, was tragically taken from us, and I will associate his neighbor, Cole Simons, uh, who was tragically taken from us earlier this month. Um, Mr. Wilson and I, I wouldn't say we were the closest of friends, but we had a, we had a, a, a friendship uh, where I would go around and visit, and he, what we had in common were, was motorbikes and um, racing. Uh, so he liked to fish, much better fish than I was, but um, also had uh, the bikes in common, and with his signature color uh, gunmetal gray for his, his bikes. You always knew when it was him. Uh, but he will be missed. Uh, was a, a, a good character. Loved to, loved to have a, a good laugh mm -hmm. um, and make people smile. Uh, so just want to have a lot of condolence sent on his behalf. Thank you. Any other member recognize the opposition uh, whip? You Thank have you, Mr. your Speaker. three minutes. I wanted to associate myself with the comments made by the Honorable Member Keynes as it relates to the EMO, uh, but most especially uh, as it relates to uh, the services and forces that worked during uh, the hurricane and helped us recover from it. Um, getting through a hurricane, uh, Mr. Speaker, is by no means automatic, and it is not a default. It requires a considerable amount of dedication from a number of people, including those uh, in the planning staff, 
but most especially those young men and women who pack up their rucksacks as the hurricane is barreling down toward us and head up to camp, to prospect, to the fire stations, to forward deploy and get ready. Because uh, what they have to do over the next 24 to 48 hours is not easy. It's tremendously difficult. And I'm always mindful that they leave behind their loved ones in a house, and they're not entirely sure what they're going to find when they get back. So to them, I give uh, thanks for their tremendous service. Thank you. Does any other, the, the MP Fogo has been jumping up and down quite a bit. I have a clear view of you now. I missed you the first time. Go right ahead, MP. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to give a brief condolences to the Richardson family in St. David's um, for the uh, loss of um, Ms. Darlene Richardson um, uh, and I believe an aunt to the member who sits, um, I forget your constituency number, Jerry and Richardson. Uh, um, and the matriarch of former Senator Curtis Richardson. Mm. So I just would like acknowledgement in the House for her loss. Um, Mr. William Bassett from St. George, I'd like to associate the uh, member from constituency one with those condolences. And with the Swan family from So Far Lane in St. David's, um, Swan Simons family, they, they lost their mother as well. But I think the House has to recognize congratulatory remarks for the great T20 St. George's cricket team who won the league. So I would like the House to, to, to understand that we are still heroes in the East. I'm talking about St. George's <laughs> at this point in time. <laughs> Yes, but St. George's and St. David's are cousins, right? And uh, there are St. David's people that sit on the St. George's team. And so I know that St. George's, St. David's is very happy with the VM. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member. Minister of Education, you have your three minutes. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just begin on a, a somber note um, in San Thank you. And send um, condolences to the family of Ms. Frances Rogers, one of my constituents that stayed in Alexander Court. Um, it was always a pleasure to go visit um, these elderly um, mm -hmm. uh, elders that, that stayed up there. As a matter of fact, they had this group. They called themselves the Golden Girls. So I'm sure Sandra, Beverly, and uh, Doreen are surely missing their friend, um, Frances, uh, from up there. Also, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm, I'm out of total surprise from the, from the Somerset contingent. Um, I would like so. Uh, I would like condolences sent to the family of Miriam Dickinson, who did pass at the, in her 150th year. She's yes. a well-known educator um, yeah. from the West End, yes. uh, who was also um, married to my daughter's great grandfather, Bishop Norris Dickinson. Mm -hmm. And so, I'd like um, condolences sent to the family, and, and of course, associate anyone else who wanted to be associated uh, with that. Came from uh, a Mr. family of educators in the West. Mr. Speaker, I'd also like to be associated with the comments on the Seafood Fest and in St. George's and also add to uh, the accolades that have been given out to um, a Rosa Fair, uh, who was the person, who was the people who organized mm -hmm. uh, that function that made up out of Ambience, um, Bermuda, and Rose of Sharon. Um, again, two dynamic um, women uh, run organizations that put together a very, very good event there, Mr. Speaker, and although it was missed by my colleague that spoke before me, I would like to send congratulations to the Bailey's Bay Cricket Team, who are the, <laughs> who are the winners, who, who um, defeated the St. David's um, Island Warriors um, in the last game. Now, Mr. Speaker, for those of us who are not familiar with that, and because we're all compact oriented here, the Eastern <laughs> Counties Association has been in effect since 1904, the second oldest competition to cup match, which started in 1902, of course, involving that, um, and I do not see a cousin here, um, Tucker's Town Cricket Club versus St. David's Cricket Club, Mr. Oh, Speaker. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, uh, I'll associate uh, the opposition leader because he does, he does hail from actually right across the street from the field where we, where uh -huh. we practice. And Mr. Speaker, in my last 50 seconds, I would like to send a hearty congratulations to everyone that was involved in the opening of signature schools at the Barclay Institute and Cedar Bridge Academy this year. Mm -hmm. It's been a work in progress. 13 months has gone into uh, the work needed to, um, to open those signature schools, and our students are much better off. 
uh, for that. We uh, have our S1 students entering into programs where they'll be exposed um, to things such as trades and business services, STEM, um, financial services, and health and um, health and social services uh, signature signature programs um, this year, Mr. Speaker. And so my hat goes off to all of the persons who have um, contributed over the last 30 months. We're talking about um, 500 plus people that have given their personal time in order to make this happen, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. You got you got a first one. You got a buzzer today, Minister. Look at that. MP De Silva. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Speaker, I I I I have to uh, associate myself with the condolences for the Tannock family. Um, as many will know, uh, Raymond ran in constituency 30. Uh, the election before I actually won the seat. And um, I spent a lot of time with Raymond, uh, actually knew him before politics, um, but um, obviously um, I was very honored to have him um, canvass with me many nights around Southampton uh, prior to my victory in 2007. So my condolences certainly go out to Barbara and the rest of the family, and he'll be sorely missed, I'm sure, by many people in Bermuda from uh, many, um, let's just say from a wide cross section of people as well. Uh, Mr. Speaker, while I'm on my feet, I would like to um, uh, send uh, congratulations to Ms. Eunice Pitt, um, who is currently in hospital, but she turns 100 on Sunday. And um, she is the uh, uh, aunt of my chairman, uh, Mr. Sean Simons. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Hopefully she'll, she'll uh, recover from hospital well and maybe go on to uh, break Bermuda's record uh, for old age. So I um, certainly wish her a happy birthday uh, on Sunday. And whilst I'm on my feet, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to um, congratulate um, Mr. Um, Cannonier. Uh, Aya Cannonier, that is. I don't want Craig to sort of think I'm <laughs> coming for him. But Aya Cannonier, and now we'll understand, and the reason I congratulate him, Mr. Speaker, because he was on the St. George's team that MP Fogo was so proud to announce had won the league. The good news is, Mr. Speaker, for, for young Cannoneer, is that it's still space for him if he wants to come up and play for Somerset. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, I, I see you concluded on that note. Um, MP Famous, you have your three minutes. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Good morning, Bermuda. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to start off with condolences for one of my dear constituents, Mrs. Zolita Smith. Nee yeah, that's Thompson. My comments there, yes. Go ahead. I assume the whole house will associate yes. themselves. Yes. I also want to give condolences for another Devonshire resident. Uh, he actually lived in C13, Mr. Jai Butterfield of um, Alexander Road. Uh, associate myself with my brothers at Belco for 30 years. We ensure more than 30 years, but every hurricane we're there. Mr. Speaker, the next name you may know, and I think MP Jackson would know, but she's not here. Uh, our brother in the Cayman Islands, Minister Kenneth Bryant, mm -hmm. has now been elected as the president of the Caribbean Tourism Association. Mm. Organization, sorry. Mm -hmm. He promises to fulfill his promise to come here and visit us. It's been a while since he made that promise to us, you know. Yeah, well, okay, you yeah. Know, I just said I'll mention it. I'm, right. I'm glad I don't wreck it now. Uh -huh. Mr. Speaker, uh, I'd like to associate myself also with Mr. I Ion Cannoneer, future St. George's cricket, <laughs> cricket cup match player, Barkley Ike. Wrong, t wrong house, but, but good team. And Mr. Speaker, the only house. 125 years ago, on this same street, Court Street, there were a gathering of 27 students, a little further north, at a place called Samaritan's Lodge. That is where the birth of the, Bar the Barclay Institute started, Mr. Speaker. So from humble beginnings on Court Street, down onto St. John's Road, and now at a sprawling campus, Barclayites have been producing leaders for the last 125 years. I repeat, leaders 
not followers, Mr. Speaker. I'm waiting for your congratulatory remark. Who are you congratulating? Oh, congratulating Barclayites, Mr. Speaker. Okay. There are so many in this house on both sides of the fence. Yeah, I'm watching the clock. But most importantly, Mr. Speaker, Barclayites and Good House. Raspique for now, Mr. Speaker. Have a great day. Uh, you lost us when you said Good House. MP Cannonier? Yes, thank you. You have your three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to be associated also to... Uh, the bereavement and condolences to the Tannock family. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the opportunity of getting to know him many years ago in the fuel industry when he was a senior at it, uh, and quite frankly, uh, taught me the ropes in the in the industry. Um, he was a leader at the time uh, <clears throat> when I came in, and uh, his insight was invaluable to uh, the fuel industry and what's going on. Uh, so we had many, many, many. Uh, Mm -hmm. moments together, just the two of us. Uh, so again, I add my condolences to the family. Uh, also, I'd like to add my condolences uh, to the Smith family. Um, Zelita and I were very, very good friends. Uh, in fact, she uh, purchased Little Tyke Service, yeah. a company that I had many moons ago and started. Uh, she was the one who took it on to make it even larger. Um, so herself, herself and uh, her husband at the time, we were very close. Uh, in the industry uh, of transporting kids to school. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, again, a tremendous loss. What a beautiful, beautiful yep. temperament uh, she had. Uh, and so, to Terry and, and the kids, uh, my condolences to them mm -hmm. um, as they continue on to bereave. I'd like to, as far as uh, congratulations are concerned, um, uh, thank Aya for carrying on the Cannoneer name in <laughs> um, We have, uh, we, the Cannoneers have been known for cricket, uh, including myself as opening bowler for St. David's. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I would have clean bowled you any day. Yes. <laughs> I don't think you would have seen the bowl. Um, <laughs> Um, but uh, also would like to thank, um, uh, on a more serious note, Cambridge Beaches. I had the opportunity um, with the opposition, uh, yes, uh, with the opposition uh, leader uh, and uh, Minister Rebain, he's uh, uh, included him and I saw him come up uh, as well. Uh, we did pass in the House, as you know, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, the allowance of them to be able to get concessions to uh, make some expansions and improvements, and my goodness, it was beautiful. I mm -hmm. did see, and I just want to acknowledge uh, the, the, the Minister of Tourism as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we did, uh, uh, I did see him there uh, as the opposition and myself uh, walked through uh, the improvements that have made there. Mm -hmm. I really, really like that uh, uh, property up there. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, and then also, uh, I'd like to uh, congratulate Balco um, and its leadership that one of our esteemed members is in the house. Uh, during the aftermath of the hurricane, uh, you could see nothing but uh, Belco trucks back and forth. And so uh, I think that buzzes Belco for you, I don't remember. Too much. Okay. <laughs> Does any other member wish to make a contribution? Uh, I think this could take us to lunch after that. Um, MP? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, associating myself with the condolences and the congratulations already. I want to end this on a lighter note and to send um, congratulations and happy birthday to our world champion, Flora Duffy, who celebrates her 35th birthday today. And uh, while I do that, I hope honorable members still clap on the next one. I'd like to send congratulations to a future world champion in something to my grandson, Chase Daly, who <laughs> celebrates his birthday today. <laughs> Long as you don't have your talent, he'll be just fine. Ah, uh, member, member, member. Thank you, members. It looks like no other members rising to make a con uh, contribution. Oh, um, before you do that, Premier, um, I'm going to just add a couple of comments to the condolences, mainly um, to where we started this morning when we had the moment of silence for a former member, just think it's only fitting we say a couple of remarks in reference to that member. Those who knew Mr. Pierman knew that Mr. Pierman was really a friend of the community. 
He was known for his undertaking business professionally, but he really was very much involved in the community over his years. And if I was to list the number of organizations that he had been involved in in Somerset, we'd be here for a time longer. I won't name them all, just to say he, had, he was actually a founding member of the West Bean with Talking Cricket. He was a founding member of the Western Kindness Cric uh, Cricket Association. Many didn't know that. He, has a, he taught at Sound Secondary. He was a member of the West End Sailboat Club, a former Commodore and Sail Forum. He was a secretary, former secretary for the Somerset Cricket Club. And I just speak those things as, he, you know, he was very much involved in the community. He was a member of Parliament from 1980 to 85, and he was a young fella who was actually his tenant who ran against him and won the seat, myself. He was my landlord where I had my business at. <laughs> no, no, he, he, he was my landlord where I had my business at the time. Uh, yes, we continued a very good relationship that lasted many years. This speaks to the type of man that he was. He didn't hold that against me. Uh, in fact, our friendship grew much more after that. I think he was relieved to be out of here, to be honest, <laughs> and pass that burden on to someone else. But I just want to, you know, have said a few remarks for Mr. Pearman because he was very, a very nice gentleman to have known, and his loss is felt throughout our community in Sands. And lastly, I'd like just to be associated with the remarks given to uh, the Smith, Bailey, Thompson family on the loss of Salida, uh, who actually a cousin. And much can be said on how she was really a warm personality that touched the lives of many that she came in contact with. She was a mother to many in the business that she ran with the uh, transporting of children back and forth to school and the programs that came out of that. So my condolences are added to what's been said to her husband, Terrence, who is one of our immigration officers, and her children and her brother and uh, pilot, Mario Thompson. With those few remarks, I'm going to call on um, <laughs> Premier to take the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Until what time do you want us to adjourn until? At 2 o'clock. Okay. Mr. Speaker, I move this Audible House to now adjourn to lunch until 2 p.m. Any objections? No, the House, the house now stands adjourned until 2 p.m.